Uh, again, welcome to Paleo Talks. We're coming to you from the Center of Excellence in Paleontology at East Tennessee State University, where we oversee this paleontology program and the Gray Fossil Site. And we're just happy to keep this going and excited to have uh, Dr. Dunn on here today, who is an assistant curator at Rancho La Brea and part of the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles. So Reagan, if you wouldn't mind just going ahead and sharing your screen. And as you start to share your screen, I'll start throwing some questions at you here. And the first thing that we do on this show is have you introduce yourself in some more detail. Where did you go to school or schools? How did you get into this field uh, and sort of get on this track that is this presentation today? All Thank right. You. Yes, thank you. Well, I grew up in Denver, Colorado, and the whole time I grew up there, I didn't really have a clue that there were so many fossils right below my feet. And that didn't happen until after my undergraduate degree, which I got at Colorado State University in cellular and molecular biology. And I worked in a lab for a while doing maize genetics, and I th thought, well, this is, this is sort of boring. I don't really want to be at the bench doing lab work which is kind of ironic because I now do tons of bench lab work. Um, so I, I got an internship at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, working with Kirk Johnson and others on, a, on the Denver Basin Project. And that was a drilling project where we took a research core from the center of the Den Denver Basin. And I didn't know anything about geology, um, but I learned, I learned geology and how to describe 2,700 feet of core during that internship. Yeah, um, lots of repetition helps one learn. <laughs> <laughs> so as a part of that internship, we also were investigating a lot of outcrops in the area. And uh, one of those outcrops was uh, the Castle Rock Rainforest, which turns out to be the oldest known angiosperm dominated rainforest known on earth. And it's about 63 million years old. And so I was really intrigued by this whole field. And uh, so I, I decided to go back to graduate school and get a master's in paleobotany through a botany department at the University of Wyoming. And I spent uh, my, my time there working on recovery from the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary in a basin called the Hanna Basin. I finished my thesis there and then got a job for the National Park Service as a paleobotanist at John Day Fossil Beds. And Josh knows that area well as many of you do. I spent about five years there and um, decided that I really wanted to go back and get a PhD. And so um, Caroline Stromberg, who studies fossil phytoliths, had just gotten a job at the University of Washington. And it was sort of the perfect scenario for to, uh, something I really wanted to learn to answer some of the questions that we had at John Day involving grassland evolution. And so I, I went up to study with Caroline and, um, and then got my PhD there. And that work led to um, these questions that I'll, I'll talk about today and this, this whole new investigation into forest canopy change. Um, so following that, I did a couple postdocs, one at the University of Wyoming and then one at the Field Museum. And, um, and now I'm here at the La Brea Tar Pits, thankfully at a job. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, so many of us on this show or previous speakers as well are vertebrate paleontologists, but you know it's the plants that these animals rely on and, and develop their communities. And it's so exciting to see the development and continuation of paleobotanical research. And you know, did did the tar pits have a paleobotanist before you were there? Not on staff. There was some paleobotanical work done in the in the 60s, and then again a little in the 70s, but not really very much. Um, there is a graduate student, Jesse Scott. I mean Jesse George, sorry, who is working, and has been working here for her dissertation work for the last four years, um, and so that's pretty much it. And there's mm. so many plant remains that people really aren't aware of. And if right. you walk through our museum gallery, you barely see a mention of it. There's just one little plaque. Um, with plants in it, and uh, we're hoping to change that. Wonderful. Well, we love our plant fossils here at the Gray Fossil Site as well. So, and, and definitely, it's not one of those things that I had taken away from my earlier visits to Rancho La Brea is that rich plant record. And so, I, I've learned about that from you and a couple of others recently. 
so very exciting to hear and, and see what will come out of all that. All yeah, right. we're really excited. And, and I won't talk about that today because I haven't been here very long and uh, we're not ready to, to sure, have sure. it yet. But I stay tuned because the potential is great. Well, maybe a future paleo talks. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's get on into it. And as you're working your way through the presentation, I'll, I'll interject uh, here and there to ask questions. So please go ahead. Okay, great. Well, thank you all for joining and happy Halloween. Um, hopefully you'll get to have some sort of celebration. Um, but I'm going to talk today. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge all the people that uh, have contributed to the work that I'll be talking about. And that's my advisor, Caroline Stromberg and also our collaborators on an NSF grant that really produced what funded all of this body of work. And that includes Richard Madden, Matt Cohn, and our Argentine colleagues, Alfredo Carlini and Martin Ciancio in Argentina. Um, so it was a really productive project. And I think we really learned a lot about these ecosystems. And so I'll primarily, well, almost solely be talking about um, South America today. And as we know, South America is home to some of the most diverse ecosystems on earth. Um, it's had a very interesting geologic past and on all of the continent, really the highest density of fossils that can be discovered occurs in Patagonia and this region highlighted. And so I'm gonna talk about Patagonia exclusively today. So Patagonia is the southern tip of South America. It's a rather narrow peninsula that juts into the Southern Ocean. Um, so in this sense, it's sort of the thermometer of the, the Southern Ocean, which is really influential on global oceanic currents, which also uh, is influential on global temperatures. Now the Southern Ocean records from deep sea cores are a large part of the, what we know about global climate for the Cenozoic through deep sea temperature measurements from oxygen isotopes. And um, you can see that record here. Many of you are probably familiar with this, but this is how we paleoecologists see the, the Cenozoic in terms of climate where you have several very warm intervals, a general cooling um, to end up where we are today. And there's several um, climatic optima in here. And this is sort of our guide to understanding Earth's climate history. So South America has had a very interesting tectonic history as well. It, uh, it's known as the an island continent or was known that way for many years. And that is the result of its tectonic separation from Gondwana, um, including Africa here in the early Cretaceous um, where it's, it spreads out. We still have here a connection to Antarctica up until about 35 million years ago when South America becomes an island continent, completely isolated, more or less. Patagonia has also been bathed in volcanic ash that comes from the Andean subduction zone. And here's an example of what that looks like still to this day from time to time, these volcanoes will erupt and just spew enormous amounts of ash across the continent. And this has been going on for many millions of years. And so I'll take you now to where this star is and you can see what millions of years of that ash accumulation has resulted in. And these are the beds of the Sarmiento formation in, in, a, in a location where we work. And as a result of all that ash deposition, you have a really excellent record of fossil vertebrates here. And here's an example of a Toxodon tooth. So are there both fossil plants and vertebrates in that deposit? Yes, well, there's only fossil plants, uh, fossil phytoliths. So there's no other plant remains that we found. Yeah, so just vertebrates. So as a result of that isolation, South America evolved a very interesting fauna. It's uh, very different than the North American fauna, but some of these forms would look pretty, look um, similar, uh, convergent on forms that we have, including Macrocinia here. The top turn that looks like a camel. We have Toxodon, the Toxodonts, um, of course, the giant um, armadillos, pyrotheres, and the marsupial carnivores that sort of resemble hyenas, the Bori hyenas. Now, one thing that many of the herbivorous animals have in common in the South American record 
is our very high crown teeth. Okay, so these are hypsodont teeth. And it's, um, it's, it's thought that hypsodonty is an adaptation to um, eating foods in a very abrasive environment. So here's your hypsodont tooth, very high crowned compared to a brachiodont tooth like our teeth. So this is like a horse tooth. Um, this abrasive diet can include foods that include silica, that are silica rich like grasses, for instance. But also these animals can be feeding low to the ground where there's a lot of grit, um, dirt adhering to the plant foods, which also make a very abrasive diet. So this form in the teeth, of course, these high crowns are, are meant to extend the life of the animal in these abrasive habitats. And to what degree do those two go together? I mean, the combination of eating grasses also potentially results in more grit on the grass because you're eating down low to the ground. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. And so sort of one of the first questions is, well, are there grasses? Okay, so that's, that's what we, we sought to, to find out. Um, so those abrasive particles in grasses are known as phytoliths, and those are uh, plant silica remains. And so here's an example of a grass plant. And the way these form in plants is that there's dissolved silica in the soil and dissolved in water. And that water travels through the plants and the silica is deposited in certain cells. In cells, in between cells, many different parts of the plants can accumulate silica. Grasses happen to have these specialized cells that, form, that serve this function, and they're known as short cells here. Um, but many other cells also take up silica. And when the plants die and decompose, all this silica is dropped into the soils. And if the soils are preserved, then you have a plant record just based on these cells, single cells in many cases. So the way we find these is we go to soil horizons. These are paleosols, and there's different evidence of paleosol formation here. There's some spectacular dung beetle brood balls from our Patagonian site. Um, here's another soil where you can see all these rhizo concretions, these rhizoliths here, and all this bioturbation. So these are these are evidence of soils. And so we can take just uh, we take a hand sample in the field, and then we process just. A, a gram of this material for the phytoliths. And so we chop it up and we run it through a series of acids and do a heavy liquid separation. And we just are interested in finding the plant silica fraction. And this is what that can look like under the microscope. So everything you see here is from a plant, all these little particles formed in some kind of plant. Now to understand what kinds of phytoliths different plants make, we have modern collections that we um, can assess. And so you can see some types of plants make really specific phytoliths, like the palm trees have these really nice phytoliths. The grasses, of course, are pretty well known to be diagnostic. But other types of plants make phytoliths that, um, that can occur in many different types of plants. So they're not oftentimes really specific to the kind of plant that you're finding. It's just that plant tissues are conserved and any part of the plant tissue can form a phytolith. Grasses, um, as I mentioned before, have uh, very useful phytolith forms and they can be taxonomically identified to some extent. So you can see here, we have some forest grasses and the different clades like the bamboos. We have these open habitat grasses from the, the Puidae subfamily. And then also these types of forms, which form in this, uh, this clade called the PACMAD, which includes six different clades of grasses. And so these can provide important habitat information. For instance, poid, poid grasses grow in cold season environments. So they're high latitude, high altitude grasses. PACMADs are typically um, warm habitats and, and, and sometimes wetter habitats, more tropical, lower lower latitude and lower altitude plants. Oops. So phytoliths in this way are useful for reconstructing the type of vegetation, not necessarily taxonomic identity. Okay, so let's go back to this idea of hypsodonty. So um, Caroline Stromberg, my advisor, did her dissertation work trying to understand how the evolution of grasslands in North America related to the evolution of hypsodonty on the continent. 
And what she found is that while high crown teeth evolved here around um, seven, 16 to 17 million years ago, grasslands preceded, open habitat grasslands preceded that evolution by about six to eight million years. Um, next, she wanted to learn more about um, Eurasia. And so she, in, by studying phytoliths in Turkey, she had found a similar pattern. High crown teeth evolved there about six million, six to eight million years after grasslands evolve. And so the pattern is holding here. First you have the grasslands and then you have the teeth to, to eat them. So what about South America? Well, high crown teeth in South America evolved 20 million years prior to hypsodont animals anywhere else on the, in the world. And so the assumption has often been that Patagonia hosts the world's earliest grasslands. And so we wanted to test this idea. The pattern is so strong in South America that um, this is, this is a, a figure showing how many different clades show this pattern of, of uh, increasing tooth crown height through time. And while I show six lineages here, there's a total of 26 clades in South America that evolved hypsodont teeth during this time period, during the Cenozoic, 13 of which evolved ever-growing teeth. So something about South America is really um, something that is really abrasive and these animals are evolving hypsodonty. So we set out to test if hypsodonty evolved in the context of early grasslands in Patagonia. And to do this, we wanted to compare a high resolution record of the vegetation and vegetation change based on phytoliths to the faunal record. And the best place to do that is at a site called Gran Barranca in Patagonia in southern Argentina. So here's Gran Barranca, the, the beautiful rocks of the Sarmiento Formation. These outcrops stretch over seven kilometers. They're located here at about 45 and a half degrees south. It's the most complete section for middle Cenozoic um, strata in South America. There's vertebrate fossils at many, many different levels. And it's sort of the Rosetta Stone for six of the, of the South American land mammal ages at this locality. And there's very well preserved phytoliths at almost every level you can find phytoliths. And since phytoliths are microfossils, you can sample very finely if you wanted to, if you had the patience. And because of all that abundant volcanic ash, we have a great opportunity for age control from radio, radioisotopic dating. And so um, the first thing we did was to refine the age control for the section. I won't go into the details, but we have great radiometric dates and also paleomagnetic sections. So we have great time resolution in these sections. Now to, to make the vegetation reconstructions from phytoliths, we, um, in our, our typical way, and this is the method developed by Caroline Stromberg, is that we would compare the types and the relative amounts of phytoliths from diagnostic morphotype classes. And um, these are basically forest indicators versus open habitat grasses. And so when we do this, our, our calculations here to, if you wanna say something is an open habitat grassland, you have to have open habitat grass phytoliths that make up more than half to 60% of your, your phytolith assemblage. And so just to show you what these classes look like, um, here are your, your typical forest indicators, which or woody plant indicators, I think is a better word. And those include palms, things in the ginger family. And these other forest indicators, which can be dicots, conifers, and fern phytolith types, and also closed habitat grasses like bamboos. And so then we compare those to the open habitat grasses from the puids and the pacmad clades. Okay, so to make a long story, story short, here is, is what we discovered in um, many of the samples that we collected. Um, so here's our stratigraphic section. It starts around 43 million years ago, and it goes up to about 12 million years here. And um, the color codes here are the relative abundance of the different types of phytoliths, where palms are the dark green, other forest indicators, dicots, ferns, gymnosperms, those are in the light green, um, these ginger kind of tropical forest floor plants are in blue, 
And what you want to look out for here are the abundances of the open habitat grasses, the puids and the pacmads, the yellows and the oranges. And so very quickly, just you can peruse this and you can see that while grasses are present, the assemblages are dominated by forest indicators in almost all samples. Grasses are present by 40 million years ago, but they are rare, making up just a very uh, small fraction of the, of, the, of the assemblages, less than 30% in most assemblages. It's with the exception of these samples up here, which have pretty high abundances of grass fossils. These are about 16 million years ago up in the mid Miocene climatic optimum. And this is at a time where there was a volcanic disturbance. There's a big tuff up here. Um, so the basic story is during this whole time period, we have very little in the way of grass. And so grasslands are not consistently present in Patagonia up until ar around 11 million years ago. So, that has, um, it raises a bit of a, a quandary for us. Um, we learned that grasslands aren't necessary for the evolution of Hypsodonti. Um, so we decided we need to test some alternative hypotheses. And those include, well, these animals could be eating a diet that's rich in other types of, of silica producing plants like palm trees, for instance. But then we thought, well, plants have pr been producing silica in their tissues for, you know, since the advent of land plants, basically. And so you don't see this persistent pattern of hypsodony um, through time like you do in the Cenozoic. So something about the Cenozoic is different. It could be, of course, grit in the form of volcanic ash falling on the forest. Or it could be that we have a, a closed habitat with volcanic ash or an open habitat. And so we had sort of very little way to understand how open these habitats were based on grass alone. So if there's just not a lot of grass in the ecosystem, that was our only metric to determine how open a habitat is. Well, there's a lot of open habitats that don't have a lot of grass. So we needed to find a different way to do it. And so that was the sort of the next task for, for my dissertation work is to test this idea. And it really comes down to questions of vegetation structure. And so what I mean by that is it's just the organization of plants in three-dimensional space, their horizontal placement across the landscape, and also their vertical stratification. And vegeta vegetation structure is critical for ecosystem and ecosystem function. It controls the water cycle, greenhouse gases, and carbon sinks, soil moisture and temperature, fire regimes, erosion, plant composition, and of course, animal habitat, diet, and how they locomote, how they make their living on the surface, including insects. So plant vegetation structure is really key to understand the ecosystem as a whole. So how do we quantify vegetation structure? Um, there's a, a very commonly used variable called the leaf area index. And what that is, is the total area of foliage per area of ground. It's a continuous variable, so you, you can measure across a, a spectrum. And just to give you an idea of what that's like, if here's a, here's a, a patch on the ground that's a, a meter by a meter, and you look up into the sky, and you have three times the amount of foliage as in that meter of ground, that's an LAI of three. So that would be a, a canopy, whereas just one layer here would be an LAI of one. So just to give you an idea of what some of these different LAI values look like, you can see here, very open habitats, little shrubbies encroaching in here, very low LAIs versus very dense forests, which have high LAIs and multi-stratal canopies. And so you can imagine if you're an animal living in these environments, you're gonna have to have very specific um, adaptations. LAI is related to most, most um, closely related to precipitation values. Um, not surprising, soil moisture is, is really a big factor on LAI and also temperature. Cold environments tend to have lower LAIs. So how in the world do we reconstruct LAI in the past? And so this was my, the big question that I, I had to think about and I attended a conference at the Smithsonian. It was 
the one of the annual LEAF Summit meetings. And if you've never been to one, they're great. Um, but what I learned there is that there's a big difference between sun leaves and shade leaves. So if you just look at the, the leaves themselves, sun leaves tend to be smaller, they're very thick, they have um, denser lamina, they have more um, photosynthetic tissue, shade leaves are flimsier, they're larger. And then if you zoom into the surface, there's many differences also at the, the microscopic level. And so this is looking at the surface of the leaf, the leaf epidermis here, this little layer at the top. And these are the cells that form the epidermis and they're called epidermal cells. And you can see in this experiment done in 1942 and that leaves that grow in full sun tend to have a different form than those grown in full shade. They are smaller in size in the sun, they're less undulated and they're more compact compared to these growing in the, in the shade. This same pattern has been documented in several dicots, ferns, and gymnosperm. So it seems to be a, a good indicator of shade. And of course, phytoliths form in these tissues. Silica will fill these epidermal cells. And when the plant falls apart, you're just left with these little individual cells in, in the soil samples and in our, uh, our paleosol samples. So the idea was that um, in a very, in a dense, forest, you would have, if you went down here and took a sample from the ground, you would have an overall abundance of shapes of, of the epidermal cells that are indicative of shade environments compared to an open habitat. So they'd be um, hypothetically more undulated and larger in size in the shade than in the sun. So to test this idea, we set up this, this idea of what the relationship might look like. This is our hypothesis where you have your, your cell morphology here that relates to the light environment, light or dark. And of course our light environment here is the leaf area index. So where leaf area index is higher, it's shadier and darker in those areas. So we, we should be able to, to detect that from a handful of cells from those environments. So I, I went, to, went to Costa Rica and now have been several other places in South America and collected soil samples across an LAI gradient. And to do that, I collected just the upper level of the soils, recorded the vegetation using a fisheye lens here to get hemispherical photographs, which then I used this program to, to, uh, to get the LAI values and of course extracted phytoliths from all many, many samples and we measured the outlines of the phytoliths, determined the, the shape parameters, including area, the area of the cell and also undulation of the cell. And here's what we found. Um, using a multivariate model, which includes phytolith area and phytolith U undulation index, this is the model that best predicted LAI. And so here is our LAI predicted, whoops, sorry, versus the LAI that we actually measured. And there's a pretty robust relationship. So we have here, our model produces an R squared, R squared of about 0.63. And so it's not bad for biology. And so we have now a model where we can predict LAI in the fossil record. And so we went back to our samples from Gran Branca, our mystery samples, and employed the new method and here's what we learned. All right, so this is the first ever record for um, LAI produced from the fossil record. And um, this is from Patagonia. And so what we see is that the, during the early Eocene, the RLA, uh, the LAI values, RLAI stands for reconstructed LAI, are quite high. So these are broad leafed forest, forest environments here. And through the Cenozoic, you have this decline in the forest canopy until you get to a point here about 38 million years ago when habitats are very open. Then following that, you have about a million years of uh, more forested canopy. Then before the Eocene Oligocene transition, you go back to very open habitats. These are interpreted as um, desert shrubland. Palms are very abundant. We interpret these to be palm shrublands with very little grass. There's very little grass in any of these. The late, uh, through the Oligocene, you have a slight regreening with some bouncing around in the Miocene. 
until you get to the mid Miocene climatic optimum here, where you see a regreening of Patagonia again, where you have broadleaf forests back in the environment and then um, forest opening up after that. So this kind of should look familiar to you. Um, it, it, the pattern of LAI really closely matches the pattern of, of deep sea temperature that we know globally. And also that, you know, this is just a Southern ocean record of global temperature. And so you have that declining um, LAI at the same time you have these declining values here. And then again, this reforestation at the mid Miocene climatic optimum which matches our, our, our pattern here. We have evidence that during these intervals where it's most open, they are drier conditions. So we have reduced precipitation at these times. So we had 38, we have reduced precipitation also around the Eocene Oligocene transition and here in this, at this time in the Miocene. And during these times, we also have increased aeolian sedimentation. So these are, these are lusses that we are sampling. And so this, this pattern is, is really fitting. We have reduced vegetation and this increase in alien sedimentation, which you expect if vegetation is sparse. And we also have evidence of fire here at this interval as well. I won't go into a lot of detail about that. Okay, so what about Hypsodonte, our question of the hour? Okay, so comparing our LAI record to the record of prevalence of um, hypsidonte or, or hypsilidonte, which is ever-growing teeth in, the, in our fossil assemblages, we see a major increase beginning around 38 million years ago and following through this entire time period. So this is really when hypsidonte is evolving. And it appears to occur at times when the LAI values are below um, 1.1 to 1.5. So these are open habitats and these animals seem to be responding in this way during this time. And there even seems to be a bit of a reversal here. There are more brachiodont taxa um, during the mid Miocene climatic optimum. And also I, I should mention too, that the primates that occur in South America or in Patagonia, which they don't occur very often, occur at LAI values of over 2.5, 2.5 and above. Um, so that's just when they're there briefly and then the primates disappear from the record. So if we look at modern LAI measured from MODIS satellites and compare that to the proportion of hypsodont taxa living today in South America, and uh, we look at that relationship and here are the various, um, various um, relationships, but here in the blue, the blue line here is a segmented regression which demonstrates that around LAIs of about 1.1, 1.2, you have an increased um, increase in the prevalence of hypsodont taxa. And so that matches our, our fossil samples pretty well. And so what we conclude from, from this work is that we know that LAI is a function of soil moisture, which depends on temperature, um, paleo CO2 or atmospheric CO2, precipitation, wind, and soil type. So where these animals are evolving this, these high crown teeth, we have evidence that there's reduced precipitation, there's sparse vegetation, which allows for um, both a, a source of source of grit into an animal's diet. So you have these open areas, the dirt blows onto the plants, the animals eat the plants. Um, so you also have the sink, the source and the sink of the dust in those same environments. We also have very ash rich soils that are very conducive to erosion, especially wind erosion, and they entrain very easily and can coat surfaces. Um, that still goes on in Patagonia. You know, if you've ever worked in Patagonia, the second you step out of the car, you have grit in your teeth. And so it's not a big surprise how this pattern evolved. And then of course, we also have evidence for um, high winds and aeolia, aeolian stratification. So instead of a grass rich diet, we feel like these are, this set of conditions is a better explanation for the evolution of this pattern in South American ungulates. 
So why, just one last sort of um, concluding thought on this is that why, why did, the, did the precipitation regime change in Patagon Patagonia during this time interval? And starting around 50 million years ago, you start having shallow openings of the Drake Passage. So prior to this, South America and Antarctica were connected. But once you have, start opening up the Drake Passage and developing the An Antarctic circumpolar currents, which completes with the opening of the Tasman Sea, which, at which point you get Antarctica completely isolated, we think that that change in, in ocean circulation created a change in precipitation in southern South America and potentially um, that's responsible for, for this pattern. Okay, so um, in the future, uh, what I've been working on over the last five years really in intensively is, is uh, making this same LAI proxy available to different kinds of leaf preservation. And that includes organic preservation like this leaf fragment over here. Um, these are leaf cuticles, which are preserved in lots of different environments, and uh, they're they're more they're much more commonly found than fossil phytoliths, and and so I think this definitely this new proxy will help open up new avenues in in many different important earth life transitions, and that includes things that we've been looking at, including the the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, also looking at the canopy change through the PETM. And now, most recently, I'm really excited to be here at La Brea and learn about habit change, habitat change during the Pleistocene and, of course, the late Pleistocene, Pleistocene extinction here at La Brea Tar Pits. And so the overall conclusions are that Hypsodonty in South America evolved in open but relatively grass-free and unstable habitats in Patagonia. LAI offers a new kind of paleobotanical record that we can quantify three-dimensional habitat change, which relates to all the things that forest canopies or vegetation um, controls about ecosystems, including primary productivity, carbon reservoirs, hydrologic cycles, um, yada, 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 uh, mammalian species, and functional diversity. And our, our, this LAI proxy seems to be a sensitive indicator of habitat change. And as I mentioned before, because it is, these are micro fossil records, you can get the highest resolution possible um, during these important earth life transitions. And so with that, I have many acknowledgements and I would just like to say thank you all very much for inviting me to talk to the group. And um, I'd love to hear any questions that you guys all have. All right, thank you, Reagan. We have. I think quite a few questions uh, coming up. I have some, but I, let's go on to looking at any we might have on Facebook, David. Sure thing. So as a reminder, uh, if you have questions, now's the time, go ahead and put them in the Facebook comments on the video, or if you can't go there, go ahead and pop over and leave your questions at the Gray Fossil Site Twitter or Instagram accounts. I'll be keeping an eye on those as well. We do have a few questions. Let's start with this, the, the requisite isotope question from Grant. Do tooth enamel stable isotopes track with phytolith data? Yeah, what the, most of the, the isotope work that has been done by Matt Cohn, it, um, it does track. And mostly it shows, the work shows that there's very little temperature change through the, through the interval, the entire interval, but that the carbon isotopes do show drying at the same times at the same time that we have the open canopies. Now everything is, is C3, so we don't learn much in the C3, C4 um, range of things, but the carbon isotopes as a precipitation indicator do match up nicely with uh, the reduced LAIs. Very cool. We've got a question uh, from one of our students. Alexis asks, are there any phytoliths that look very similar to each other, making them difficult to identify to a particular plant? And if so, are there particular techniques to identify those? Ah, yes, great questions. Phytoliths are not great for taxonomic reasons. Um, there, are, there are many attempts to, to try to get better information from phytoliths that use like 2D morphometrics. 
and those those methods seem to be working. And um, that's as far as the the fossil samples go, because vegetation has sort of all the similar organs, right? It has veins, it has vascular tissue, it has epidermis. Um, a lot of a lot of those tissues are just that preserve as phytoliths aren't diagnostic of any particular plant. But you can see differences among the different grass groups and even grass genera can now be distinguished using these 2D morphometric methods. And that's encouraging. I, um, Dr. Stromberg's group just had a paper out on that that uh, is, is very is encouraging. Um, because these are so tiny, you know, you have to do a lot of manipulations to roll them around. They're little three-dimensional blocks. And so it's a, they're a little tricky to handle and to photograph, but with better microscopy and resolution, um, hopefully that's possible. And there is some effort to, to use some AI to try to start identifying types too, which would be great. And those are just early days on that, but that would be fantastic. So, Very interesting. Go ahead, Blaine. Yeah, so with the, this new knowledge and this new technique, can we apply this to, yeah, let me show myself, can we apply this to the North American record now and refine and rethink about what hypsodonty means up here? Oh yeah, absolutely. And uh, there, there are some students in, in uh, Caroline's group who are doing this with her Great Plains record. And so I look forward to seeing the results. All right, um, so I that's in, in process. Exactly, and I also have some records from Oregon that will shed light into that from the John Day area, but mostly just mid Miocene onwards. We weren't able to get good phytolith preservation in uh, anything older than about 18 million there. Okay, thank you. We've got another question from another of our students. Kelly asks, have any studies been conducted in Antarctica to see the changes in vegetation reconstruction similar to the ones done in Patagonia? Not yet. Um, most of the Antarctic record is known from ocean cores, and so those are pollen pollen records, uh, which are you know are, are they give you a good taxonomic look at reconstructions during that time, and it's very interesting during the Eocene. There's palm pollen, so there were some palm forests growing in Antarctica during the the early Eocene climatic optimum. And, um, and, and the mid Miocene climatic optimum. So there are some, but they're just based on the, the ocean cores. There, um, I think there's one paper of a phytolith record from one of the marine cores, but um, it, that's, that's quite a few years ago. And I don't, I'm not sure they could come up with any good um, conclusions based on sort of few phytoliths that you find out in the middle of the ocean. So in terms of phytoliths and their preservation, what's a good environment for their preservation? What's a bad environment for their preservation? Yeah, so phytoliths preserve where bones preserve oftentimes. So that's sort of the advantage of them too. They, they can withstand those types of oxidizing environments. They don't preserve well, typically in red beds, you don't, you don't get a lot of preservation, if, um, especially if the red beds are, are really chemically altered. They, they can't withstand basic conditions. They can handle acidity, but basic conditions, pH is above nine, you, they start to dissolve. And then anything that's secondarily um, silicified, like cherts or um, like silcretes or anything like that, they'll, they'll be completely dissolved. Um, volcanic ash is great. Soils that form from the top work out really well. And I think that's why Patagonia, it, our samples in Gran Branca have such great preservation because the soils are forming from, from the top, top to bottom. So you're getting deposition of the ash. And so the soil levels are, are going up and up and up instead of having like bedrock soil formation where you have a lot of chemical weathering going on. So with this change in interpretation of hypsodonty and how it might form, has this been contentious at all? No, I don't think so. I think... Okay. Uh, you know, the debate rages on and uh, it, it's, the debate has sort of moved to um, experimental work where animals are being fed different amounts of volcanic ash, comparing volcanic ash to phytoliths and looking at microware and, and mesoware and stuff like that. And um, 
yeah, it's interesting work. You know, volcanic ash is very abrasive. I think that's what the results are coming out to show. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, and phytoliths can be too, but especially if you have the combination, then that's just really. Exactly. Abrasive. In many cases, it may be the combination that pushes it really, you know, in extreme yeah. ways. Mm -hmm. I see we have some other questions. It looks like Josh Samuels has a massive one, David. <laughs> yeah, Josh is here. Josh, do you want to pop in but and ask That's actually question? two. Okay. Um, yeah, it's two questions. <laughs> we have Dr. Josh Samuels here. Howdy. Um, so the first one is you have the charts talking about your undulation index for the phytoliths and your relative LAI. And one thing I didn't see in the, the plots you had was a direct comparison between that RLAI and Hypsodonty index in the same communities. And the question was, is since the animals are, they're reflecting the plants they're feeding on, would you maybe have a better association between Hypsodonty index and that LAI than you do direct climate parameters like temperature and precipitation. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. I I never for some reason thought to plot Hypsodonty index uh, on those plots. And I you know I have to see if we have all those measurement data. Um, it takes actual measurement data instead of just like yeah. this. Um, but that's 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 good. That would be very interesting to see. Um, and then well, so the second part of that was just comparing it to the climate records. Yeah, well, I mean, I would expect that maybe you would have a strong correlation between Hypsodonty index and this LAI since it's reflecting the plant communities and that maybe you would have a better relationship between that Hypsodonty index and that than you would with mean annual temperature or precipitation, those kinds of variables. Oh, just yeah. Because the, the animals are responding to the plants more than they are how hot it is outside or how much it rains. Absolutely, and I didn't show much of the isotope data, but as um, as the as I just mentioned before, two different studies that on isotopes that Matt Cohn has looked at is you don't see a temperature change in Patagonia during that time. Um, subsequently, there's been another story, another paper out that does show a temperature change at the Eocene Oligocene transition. So temperature change is pretty much stable. Our temperature seems to be pretty much stable we'll say, um, across the most of the time. So then you're just looking at precipitation. And the precipitation record has, uh, has yet to be really fully developed. A lot of the precipitation record comes from is uh, qualitative looking at, at soils um, other than, than the, the C13 um, mean annual precipitation estimates that, has, that Matt Cohn has made. And the problem with that is that the vertebrate fossils are coming from a large, you know, they're pretty time averaged across a big part of the section, whereas our samples are spot samples. So you can't, somehow you have to, it would take the right situation where you had a quarry, say, of the vertebrates and a, a sample from that quarry. And mostly the, the record is just sort of, the vertebrate record smeared out over, you know, several, several twenties of meters across the outcrop. The other question I had was about that vertebrate record. And you mentioned how in South America, grasslands appear early and mammals responded very early on by having high crown teeth. You said 20 million years earlier than in North America, but that's related mostly to the ungulates. And it, when it comes to the smaller mammals in North America, rabbits and rodents both show high crown teeth at the same time that you see some of these things in South America. So the question I had is um, how big are some of these early high crown things? And might it be that small animals are taking advantage of small patches of open habitat vegetation and thus showing an early response? Um, and whereas some of these bigger things like horses and rhinos don't respond as quickly because they need lots of space. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, some of the latopterns and things are, are really small, sort of rabbit-sized animals. Um, so they, we are getting that, that body size class showing that pattern as well. It's not just the largest mammals. Um, oh, sorry, the interotheres. I'm not a vertebrate paleontologist. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but many of those, the interotheres and many of those toxodont taxa are pretty small in body size. Um, okay. There's also 
some there's um somebody who's going to be working on the the rodent record from from Patagonia as well. And so that'll be a great comparison to look at the rodents. We talked last week about body size with bison. And so when you mentioned little potential of little tiny like like opterns, I I got pretty excited. <laughs> yeah, interest ears. I think they're interested. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well we ended up talking about, you know, bison size getting smaller and smaller and the potential of having lap bison. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> of course, the problem with looking at rodents in the Patagonian record is that they don't appear until the um, Oligocene Miocene in South America. Yeah, that part yeah and in, in North America, rabbits with ever growing teeth show up at 37 million. And so it's, it's about the same time that you were getting some of these things in South America with those really high crown teeth. And so it, maybe it is just some of these smaller animals could take advantage of these new open spaces. In an early in an early time period, yeah, lots of volcanism then too in North America. Well, and they're living in places that were volcanically active as well. I mean, do you think, well, both Reagan and Josh, we could get to a point where we're saying this might not have much to do with grasses? I don't know that I would say from the things I study that it does in a lot of animals because a lot of them don't eat grasses. A lot of the really early high crown organisms don't feed on grass. And there's a lot of living rodents that have really tall teeth like beavers. They don't feed on grass and they don't live out in the open. There's, I would say it's probably kind of attrition and it can come from lots of sources. It could come from having to do lots of chewing tooth tooth contact, but also things like the abrasive ash in the environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's all just functional life for the tooth. So whatever. <laughs> experiencing this decreasing the functional life of their tooth. It, and I don't know if there's going to be one answer for anything. That's what I would say. Yeah. yeah. David, any other questions out there? Um, it looks like we have answered our online questions and we are right about at the end of our time here. Uh, I was going to ask a, a, a very simple, small question. Reagan, you mentioned in answering a uh, uh, Blaine's question earlier that phytoliths tend to preserve where bones preserve mm -hmm. and that made me think uh, do you think does that mean that every vertebrate fossil site dig team should have a few paleobotanists along with them? <laughs> Always. <laughs> <laughs> and vice versa yeah. So. yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. no, always. You know, I think that uh, uh, every every collaboration that I participate with with vertebrate paleontologists on the team. I mean, it's just a great synergy. You know, it's the vertebrate paleontologists. They don't know how to look for plant fossils necessarily. Um, you know, paleobotanists have a keen sense of where what's going to pr be preserved where. They know what spatial resolution is needed. Um, they know how to, to do the work. And I think it's essential that you guys all have your paleobotanist with you. Um, and paleobotanists need jobs too. So <laughs> <laughs> it's important, you know, plants are sort of like the habitats where everything lives. So terrestrial habitats, and it's really important. All right. Well, thanks to everyone who asked us questions uh, and for joining us today. Thank you again, Reagan. We'll see All everybody right. next week. Thanks, guys. Happy Halloween. <laughs>